stay on time. So uh, it's my really great pleasure uh, to introduce our uh, VAMOS speaker for today, uh, Kai Mei Fu. So um, Kai Mei did her PhD with Yoshi Yamamoto at, at Stanford, uh, and then want, went on to do a postdoc at HP Labs in Palo Alto. Um, and in 2011, Kai Mei became a professor of both physics and electrical engineering at the University of Washington. Um, and since her time as a postdoc and um, at, at the University of Washington, she's done a lot of really pioneering work on investigating sort of the property, fundamental properties of defects in solid state um, that, we'll, uh, that we'll hear about today. Um, Kai Mei has won a number of awards, including the NSF Career Award and also the Cottrell Scholar Award. And she's also taken on a major um, leadership position in a lot of the quantum activities that are taking place uh, in the Pacific Northwest and at the University of Washington. Uh, so anyway, I'm really looking forward to her talk and I'll let you take it from here, Kai. Thank you, Shimon. So it's really um, a pleasure for me to be here today and give this talk. Uh, my title of today's talk is Quantum Point Defects. Can these defects be less well defective? And really what I wanna do in this venue is share my, my research and results from my own research, but also give the community some idea of the challenges that exist as an inspiring, inspiring the community to address the challenges rather than saying, oh, maybe this is not so promising. So it's not that they're so defective, it's just a way, you know, really, really want to make these types of systems understand them better and make them better. So an overview of today's talk is an introduction to quantum networks and defects, um, creation and integration of diamond-based defects in devices. It could be also called whack-a-mole, that section. And then the final one is semiconductor donor qubits of optical axis. Just give a glimpse of a, a new defect or a new or defect, actually a very old defect. All these defects are very old, but a new look at an old defect um, for, for applications. Okay, so at the end of each of these sections, I'm gonna do a break. I have very little interaction with anyone in this venue. And so it'd be wonderful to have questions. And I, yeah, I love all questions. Please put them in the chat or the Q and A so we can make this more interactive. We don't have to get through every one of my slides in this, in this hour long talk. All right, so an introduction to quantum networks and defects. When we use the word quantum network, in our head we have this abstract picture of a graph of nodes and edges. In the, in the quantum world, uh, each node is denoting a qubit or qubit register, and each edge is denoting some form of entanglement when I'm using the word quantum network, okay? Applications for quantum networks can very broadly be put into two categories. Um, the edges are really long. We think about communication networks or the so-called quantum internet. If the edges are really, really short, uh, we can think of having a network within a single chip, within, within a single device. And this becomes um, a platform for universal quantum computing. In these type of overview slides, um, I often give references at the bottom to to, to kind of general review articles or other articles that I think have influenced my, my own vision of, of this background of, of these applications for these, these defect, quantum defect type systems. Okay, so this is, this is a pretty abstract picture of, of a graph state. And I like to just use the constructive definition of the graph state, what does, is usually meant when we put a line between these two quantum nodes. And what is normally meant is a, is a control phase gate, which is showed in the circuit representation here, or the input states of two maximum superposition states to this output state where you just have a phase a flip in front of the one one state. If you are coming from a computer science background, which may not be the case in VAMOS, you may, you may just like the matrix form of what that line means between the edges. All right. When we view these types of interactions, we think, oh, you know, this has to be an interaction. I got to bring my qubits close. I need to know, is it dipolar? Is it exchange? What's going to happen physically to make it possible to create these links? Um, well, this type of state is actually local unitary equivalent to a Bell state, which means that if I have this state, I can do single qubit operations and transform it into a Bell state. Or if I have a Bell state, I can do single qubit transformations and transform it into this, this, this graph state link. All right. 
what is great for defects, actually it's great for the entire quantum information community in general, uh, in some sense, is that edge creation does not require local interactions, all right? And uh, this graph, there are, there are many ways to create this edge non-locally, but they all fundamentally require a, a few basic um, requirements. They have a few basic requirements. I do think it's instructive to actually go through just one protocol in real time at the start of my talks because it kind of makes you in your head bin like all the requirements of this particular protocol and give you an idea when you're starting to go into the material science of actually what's important here and what's not important. So I like the Barrick and Koch protocol that's referenced here for a couple of reasons. One is you can go through half the protocol. It only takes about five minutes of a talk. And the second is that this is the actual protocol that's implemented um, in the NV centers by the Delft group, Ronald Hansen's group. And so it's, it's, it's a practical interest as well. In this particular protocol, you have two atoms, A and B. And these atoms are represented by three level energy diagrams where the bottom two levels are your qubit levels. You begin, and then one of these levels is optically coupled to some excited state. These lower levels, gigahertz type splittings, and then this of course is optical type splittings. In this level, we first need to initialize the states, then we need to create the maximum superposition. I have dropped prefactors in this, and then I've added this little ket on the end to mention that says vacuum to tell you whether or not there's an, anything in the electromagnetic field modes in this system. So the first thing we do is we apply a microwave pulse to create the superposition state. The next thing is we optically excite. Conceptually, it's easiest to just think we just do a pi excitation up to this excited state. So we've completely transferred this zero state up to this E state. And that's what you see here, zero gets replaced by E, right? Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to skip a step because I know the protocol in advance. And I know that I'm only gonna keep states where I get one click on one, photo, on one of these. And I know that if I have the EE state, I'm gonna get two clicks, there's two photons. If I have the one one state, I'm gonna get no click. And so I'm just gonna throw those out now and be left with this entangled state right now, because that's what I'm going to do at the end anyway. And mathematically, it's easier just to do it right now. Then this, this excited state is going to decay. And that's this path forward. It's decaying. And this photon now is going to be incident on a beam splitter. All right. And we have beam splitter operations to say, all right, I am going to create first create a photon in the right or left path here. And then after we hit the beam splitter operation, I'm going to create photons in the right or left path here. And so that's what we have here. We have done the beam splitter operation, split AR into BR and BL, AL into BL and BR. And I've done some math here to show you what the result is. What this is saying is I'm going to be left with a superposition of these two spin states, a Bell state superposition of these two spin states, and a photon at the left detector or a different uh, entangled state with a photon at the right detector. As soon as one of those detectors click, the right or left, I'm gonna collapse into the corresponding entangled state. So if we take a step back, what we basically said is that if I have two defects, as long as they interact with an electromagnetic field, I never have to bring them together in order to uh, create an entangled state. It's a heralded entangled state, but I never have to bring it together. And after my, you know, decade or so in this field, I really like the idea that all I have to control theoretically is my defects and their interaction with an electromagnetic mode that I'm going to be naive enough to think that I can control. I don't have to control anything else to build this up. And so that's very intellectually pleasing to me given all the errors that can occur when you have many, many interactions going on. Okay, so that's a protocol and in the back of our head, we've kind of run through it. And so we can refer later on to what we require of these atoms, right? So as I mentioned before, these types of graph states are universal quantum computers. This is just a, an example of what the graph would look like for a circuit diagram. So you can maybe believe me if you don't believe me that it's true. And we would think, all right, 
let's use atoms and ions. This is a VAMOS AMO seminar. Uh, and that's the ideal qubit. And that's great, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today because there's an advantage instead of using the absence or <laughs> misplacement of an atom. So just like an atom purely in vacuum is going to have discrete quantized levels, the absence of an atom or the absence of two atoms of a substitution in a perfect periodic lattice is also going to have quantized levels, right? And so the name of the game is find these quantized levels and find the system that matches whatever energy diagram with connections that you needed for the particular protocol that you want to go after. Or alternatively, you can characterize all this and talk to a theorist and tell them to give you a protocol that will leverage the interactions that you have in your system, right? In reality, the system is much very messy. This is a figure from a 2019 review article on all that was known on that day about the nitrogen vacancy center in Diamond. There's a lot of stuff going on. This, many of the things that go on in these processes are actually fall more into condensed matter physics. In optics, we'll detect it and see it, but I'm not gonna go into kind of the messy condensed matter physics for, for this audience. So then you characterize all of this, try to understand it as best as you can in order to then try to implement something that is much simpler coming out. Okay. Um, so now that we have these, these defects in our head and this is what we're gonna use and why do we wanna use them? Everyone will just tell you it's because it's in a solid state. We have so much more ability to control them, create them, keep them still. They don't get untrapped typically. Uh, and, and so maybe we can build something scalable. All right, if we go back to this, this diagram, of this one particular protocol, we can see the type of requirements. And I want to emphasize that there's so many quantum protocols and so many different applications. And having this list of what you need to start with or even think about it is a very powerful, powerful tool. If you're a student out there thinking about it, um, it's, it's nice to think about this. All right, so we need a three level qubit, a three level system. We need a long qubit coherence time. These may be somewhat more obvious. We need to be able to initialize. You can go back to DiVincenzo's, like what does a quantum computer need and, and go back to that, that seminal paper. We need qubit control. Often this is microwave or RF control. Spin selective optical transition. This is a little bit particular to the control. That's what it's saying is I need to be able to selectively excite from either this spin or this spin. And that has consequences on what the optical properties can be like in your system. Efficient photon transition. This may seem very silly, but you have to get the photon out. <laughs> like you need that photon and that may be one of the more challenging things. And you need to collect it. You need to collect it, route it, and detect it. And if anyone says that's just engineering and throws it under the rug, <laughs> I would say that we will never make it until this engineering problem is solved. And maybe, it, I mean, it is sense engineering, but it's very important engineering that needs to happen that is non-trivial, all right? Um, and then finally, and we can after people, you know, Shimon mentioned that there can be a talk at the end of what's really required, what's not really required with students. I'm just going to say we need indistinguishable photons. We can talk about what is meant by this and, you know, philosophize later because there's things that you can always relax, but we need indistinguishable photons. For all these protocols, if you know there's some way to have an imprint of which defect these photons came from. It doesn't really matter what detector came off of. You will not have an entangled state. We like to use clever language. You're saying we erase which path information. That's what we say in the field, right? We say that. And that's what we're saying is, is if, we if we don't have the information of which one it came from, then it came from a superposition of the two. And that's the key is to have those photons be indistinguishable. And the protocol that I talked about required um, is probabilistic. You need more than two qubits per node to ever scale up a network because you basically need some qubit that can store the entanglement while you're probabilistically creating entanglement to nearby nodes. All right. And, and there's all sorts of other nice features that people want because they're greedy. Things like room temperature operation or working at telecom wavelengths. There's all sorts of things that people say they want. I will call these nice to have features. They will be nice to have, um, but not necessary per se for the protocol. Okay. 
For defects, we're gonna dig in into a few more of these because I wanna make sure defects have a good name. This qubit coherence time of the ground state, right? We want it to be long lived. People say, just use ions, they're amazing. Qubit coherence time for trapped ions are amazing. The record, and if anyone says there's been a new record, just email me, I'll update my slides, is Euterbium, 60 minutes, great. Superconducting transmon. This is a really advanced technology relative to other ones, 0.3 milliseconds. So you gotta do things pretty fast on that time. And that is our current state of the art as a community. Phosphorus and silicon, who knew? 39 minutes, right? 39 minutes at room temperature. This was an experiment. It is in the nuclear spin. 30 experiment where they initialized that nuclear spin, raised their cryosat to room temperature, brought it back down to low temperature, and then read it out, right? Because the readout had to be low temperature. What I want to emphasize here is that it's nothing inherent in being in the solid state that means you're going to have a, a short decoherence time. What it, it, it's a combination of the properties of the materials and the defects and very, very long coherence prop times are possible. Okay. That said, when you measure it, they can go from sub picoseconds to minutes. You want, in a lab, like, like Shimon said, I do a lot of fundamental work in their properties. You wanna have the kit to be able to measure across that entire range because you don't always know what you're gonna get in advance. All right, multiple qubits per node for local operations. Um, this is so you can, in a fault tolerant way, be able to build up fault tolerant and deterministic way, be able to build up a network. What do defects have to offer right now? Uh, there was really seminal work that came out of uh, Tim Tomino's group in Delft that showed that you could have a 10 qubit register, which leveraged the local uh, nuclear spins within a diamond, it's about 1% carbon 13, to create a 10 qubit register. That's state of the art right now. So having small numbers of small numbers of qubits is really, really feasible in these systems if you have a small number of nuclear spins. The deterministic creation of a register is still, is still beyond our reach. And the deterministic uh, creation of registers that consist of multiple electronic states is also with beyond the community's reach. And so these are outstanding challenges, but at least we have some registers that have been, that have been demonstrated. Uh, a stable, efficient spin optical interface. If you look at this kind of idealistic diagram, and then we look at what does the light look like that's emitted from the nitrogen vacancy center in diamond, uh, what you can see this line corresponding to this level right here is actually about six lines that are all smushed up into this line right here. You need to access one of them. And then we have a lot of other stuff going on, all right? So when we look at a system, we're basically asking how good is this line compared to how good is, is this other stuff? And at least with the NV center, it's good enough to have done some great proof of principle operations. It may be good enough with some device integration to do a lot more. And there's other defects that have this type of level structure that you want. Not ideal, but you can extract it out. And there's a lot of considerations that go into this concept of a stable, efficient spin optical interface. Some of them are fundamental. The radiative dipole moment, interaction of phonons. Um, Non-radiative transitions can, act, can be fundamental to the material. They can also be non-fundamental, non charge state stability. So there's many fundamental and non-fundamental considerations and sorting them out is really important. You're never gonna have the perfect material. You wanna know, are you limited by fundamental considerations or non-fundamental considerations? If I devote a lot of money into cleaning up this material, will I get better results? Or did I just flush that, that resource and time down, down the toilet? All right, and then the last one I said is identical photons in every way, shape and form, space, frequency, time, they need to be transform limited. And what's wonderful is the zeroth order defects are identical. We imagine we have a perfect crystal, we create this defect and they all look the same, okay? But we, everyone in the defect community knows that they're not. Right. This is just an example of NV centers that have been in, created by implantation and annealing. And 
we take the spectra, we see they all look kind of the same on our spectrometer, plotting wavelength and intensity, and we need to zoom in on the zero phonon line here. And when you zoom in onto the zero phonon line, you can see that NV1 kind of likes to wander in its frequency and jump around. NV2 is actually pretty well behaved. This actually is probably just our laser drift at this point. Um, and then this one here, this 14N is one that, that came along for the ride. We didn't, we didn't create the nitrogen deterministically by implanting, but it's just one that, that came along and this is how this one behaves. And they're all at slightly different frequencies, all right? And this is because they have a fingerprint of their environment. Each of them are, are not identical if you go beyond zeroth order. All right, so I'm going to pause now because I kind of set the stage in the first 20 minutes um, of, you know, of, of this field, and I can pause for questions before moving on into the material systems. Yeah, so there are a couple questions. Um, you mentioned that deterministic generation of local registers is kind of currently beyond our reach. So one question is, do you think that's a necessary is that a necessary ingredient to actually build scalable quantum networks and quantum computers with these technologies? Or can we live with random sort of individuals? Yeah, so I love that question. I, I don't think anything is necessary. I think it's necessary to get a certain number of components working well, right? But if you have one or two things that are not, not possible, you can work around it. But you know, when I think of the NV center, I think, why can't we just have a bunch of NV centers and you know, have a protocol that just does the complete RS spectroscopy on it, finds all the coupling, says, you know what, I'm going to decide that this register is a good five qubit register. Everything beyond those five qubits, I'm going to call noise and decouple from. This one here has these couplings. I've decided this is a six qubit register. These are all the coupling strengths. And that's how this is going to be, right? And you do this for, you know, somehow, because AI is going to rule the world one day, this... <laughs> <laughs> this machine learning happens on all of these thousands and thousands and magically they all stay stable uh, and you can connect them all. So I don't think theoretically you do need that, but it would solve, it would make other things easier if you had it. Um, okay, maybe a follow-up question to that then is, you know, that seems really daunting to have any, do you, like, you know, are there any good ideas about how you might try to make these local registers more deterministic? Yeah, so there are ideas, not in Diamond, but something that I've always wondered hasn't happened is, you know, we saw this great, this great work is always coming out of Australia with the phosphorus and silicon. And they show that they can place a single phosphorus within a lattice site. It's like an uncertainty of half a lattice site of where they place the phosphorus. That turns out to have the, the silicon devices are all electronic. Silicon's complicated. It has many conduction valleys. There's all these interference effects. I'm sure people people know some some of these these issues. Um, so you know the half lattice site isn't that isn't so great. However, the way they do it, I can see like you should also be able to do that with silicon 29s, right? And that's never been demonstrated. You can imagine actually doing this and placing all the silicon 29s where you want. I'm going to talk about a semiconductor system at the end of the talk. It is so immature compared to silicon, but it is a donor system. And we are getting good incorporation of donors through implantation. And is it possible in a material that's not quite as hard as, as diamond, a material that can be grown epitaxially, can you put in different isotopes and nuclear spins? And I think the answer on a on at least a theoretical physics possible level is absolutely yes, based on what's been done in silicon. Great, thanks. So a question from uh, from YouTube, um, which I think you you kind of tried to punt to the post seminar discussion, but uh, but it seems like there's demand uh, to d talk about it now. So what what quantifies whether or not my photons are distinguishable, and how is it related to sort of how I do my photon detection? Yeah. So in the end. Uh, you would perform something called a Hongu Mandel experiment, which actually determines do they actually interfere with each other in the maximal possible way. And there's all sorts of tricks you can do. Very, very simply, you can imagine, well, I'm just going to spectrally <laughs> filter both of them. And I'm, you know, I'm just going to get what 1% of the light go through. And this filtering, I'm going to lose on efficiency, but then they're going to be identical. I think that's the conceptually easiest way to do. 
you can do the same thing time. You can use fast detection. I'll talk about other ways you could things you can do that are a little bit more sophisticated um, that doesn't involve filtering as well. But the, the basic idea is some sort of filter, whether it's in the time domain or the frequency domain is the zeroth order way. Um, great, I think we can uh, you know, move on for now and save some of the rest of, qu of the questions for later. Great. Okay, so the next is creation and integration of diamond-based defects and devices. And I wanna just say, what are the opportunities for defects? Why are we so excited? I said, it's in a solid state environment. And the big opportunity that people have known for like decades is you can theoretically capture a photon very efficiently if it's in a solid state. What we wanna do is we wanna make all the photons go the way we want them to go, right? This is a very simplistic uh, answer. And you'll see how people do that in a moment. We want even though the emission properties aren't perfect, there's ways to alter them. So for example, the NV center, we can ask the question, only 3% of the emission is in the, in the line that we want. Well, people have shown they can make 90% of the emission in that line by putting it in a device. They can actually alter that ratio between the zero phonon line and the phonon assisted transitions. Because it's in the solid state, I will argue that it's easier to do that. And then, um, and so these are just different ways of, of devices. They, they look very different right now um, from many groups from around the United States that are trying to do this altering emission properties. And then there's scalability. The concept that if it's in a solid state, it's going to be more easy to miniaturize and scale and mass, mass produce. The challenges though is, you know, we have to detect uh, the, the right photon, as we said. We're starting in the solid state. Often there's a lot of types of photons we don't want to start, we're starting with. Uh, stability. We can call stability homogeneity in time. Uh, the defects are not nearly as homogeneous in time as atoms trapped ions are or trapped atoms. And then we have homogeneity, which I'm saying is homogeneity in space. We've mentioned this before, all the defects have their own fingerprint. This is just showing you the homogeneity, which is 100 times too broad if you don't do anything to the defects when they're just, the, the NV centers are just grown in. And then they increase by, you know, a factor of a few fold if you're looking at ones that you've created by implantation and annealing, created quasi-deterministically. Okay. So a case study in this problem is we want to efficiently enhance and collect photons from the nitrogen vacancy center in diamond while maintaining the nitrogen vacancy optical coherence. That's our goal, because then we can route these photons together and we can implement a protocol like the one I showed at the very beginning of the talk, right? The way you do this is you put the defect into a cavity and enhance the emission into the transition that you want utilizing the Purcell effect. In the Purcell effect, you are having a feedback on the photons that you want to interact with your defect, you're increasing the photonic density states at that one particular frequency, causing stimulated emission to occur at that frequency. And that stimulated emission is into a mode that you know, so you kind of then two, killed two birds with one stone, you're getting more emission into the zero phone online, and those photons are shooting out into a mode that you want. This is the enhancement factor of the lifetime due to this Purcell effect. There's many things that it depends on, but kind of the big highlights is you want a high quality factor. You want the light to stick around in that cavity for a long time. You want a small mode volume. This is where solid state becomes great. You can make a tiny, tiny cavity. And then you need the NV center to be in the cavity or overlapping strongly with the cavity mode. And you need the orientation of the dipole moments to align with the cavity mode, okay? Um, and just as a heads up, because I really like to do this, we have amazing fabrication fields at University of Washington. Everything that you see is going to have been fabricated uh, here, here at, on campus. Okay. So we, in my group, said, all right, we know NV centers aren't super happy. We're going to do a hybrid platform, right? We're going to do a hybrid platform where in our heads, we're going to say, all right, we're going to make the NV centers as happy as possible in the diamond, first of all. And then we're gonna have a second layer, a light guiding layer made out of a different material that's gonna route the light all over the chip. All right, and that's how we're gonna do this interaction. This cavity, this Fabry Pro cavity is now a little micro disc cavity where you get the constructive interference 
as long as, you know, as you go around the ring, you constructively interfere. That's when your cavity mode will happen. Okay. Why gallium phosphide? Anyone can tell me a better material, please email me uh, directly because I do this literature search every few years. A whitish band gap material, 2.3 electron volts. So it's not going to absorb any photons in the, vi in the visible as, as long as you're longer than green. High index, you can guide on top of high index diamond, which is 2.4 nanometers. High quality MBE is possible. We actually have devices now with quality factors greater than 100,000 for frequency conversion devices, not for these photon collection devices. And this is for, this is just saying like, these, this is really good material, right? You can make state of the arts. And there's also interesting features for people out there that are interested in many different types of interactions with defects. There's this huge, not huge, a large second order optical nonlinearity. And there's also a high acoustic optic figure of merit. So it's a really nice playground for, for quantum, um, quantum devices, okay? So these are kind of what the systems look like. We implant NV centers that are very close to the surface so they can interact with the evanescent field that's leaking from the gallium phosphide um, into, into the diamond, All right? And so these are three little cavity devices. And then we input and output through these grading couplers that you see here on the chip, okay? And what we did, um, like like maybe uh, eight years ago or so was we could excite a single NV center, we could collect the light, we could tune the cavity mode so it's on resonance. So the light from the NV center starts to really come out of this here. We can verify through looking at the correlations of the arrival times of photons that we have uh, a single photon emitter. This is, this, this is denoted or, or noted by doing a correlation measurement where you wanna see this little peak go down to zero. So we're like, all right, we have single NV centers. And then by doing careful characterization, or I say Mike doing careful characterization of all the losses within this whole system, you can say, all right, if I excite a single center, what's the probability that I'm going to get a photon into this waveguide that's a zero phone online photon, all right? And so Mike calculated it and or these measurements and said, all right, 10% of the photons emitted by the defect are into that zero phone online and into the waveguide in one of the two directions in this case, versus 3% of the light being into the zero phone online in all directions, mainly being trapped into diamond. So this is a nice proof of concept that you know the platform works reasonably well. People can say increase the cues, make the coupling better. It's, it's reasonable. But anyone with a keen eye can say, what's that wiggling stuff going on, right? Why is that nitrogen vacancy center resonance moving around? And that's not good. I can see it moving around using a relatively low spectroscopy system, right? It's moving around on the order of 10, tens of gigahertz in this case. And that's going to not make me have indistinguishable photons, right? That's this, all right? So after a significant effort in my group, you know, using what's been happening in the community in general, we can get reasonable centers 100 nanometers from the surface by implantation and annealing. Right? So this is the data that I showed before where you wouldn't want to work with this NV center, but an NV center like this looks quite good. Right? It's like, oh, great, but it's 100 nanometers away. I don't have enough evanescent field from this gallium phosphide to get good coupling in this hybrid platform. So we asked the question instead of, all right, well, what if we do planar, planar collection, right? And we have constraints. We want we, we have the, the NV center has to be 100 nanometers from the surface. We want a really small footprint. And I can say why we want that footprint soon. And we want no diamond etching. We're not going to etch into the diamond at all anymore. And I'm going to back up and say there's many ways to create a scalable system. And in this particular case, we're asking, you know, is this a way that we could imagine collecting from doing entanglement out of plane? For example, using some type of switching network like you see here. Since this paper, this review article was published you know, over a decade ago, we actually would imagine having something a little bit more sophisticated in this case here, where we could actually switch individual defects into just even a two, de two detector array. Like, so we can do some fast out of plate switching using acousto-optic modulation or other types of modulation to entangle an array of these. And now you can see the somewhat the potential advantage of having defects are all just sitting there on the solid in the solid. And we've done this. Okay. So we said, all right, we want this. 
what can we do with the gallium phosphide to get a reasonable collection efficiency, right? When something's only a micron by a micron, and the reason why we want a micron by a micron is long-term we wanna be able to put electrodes around it to be able to tune the individual NV centers so they're all at the right frequencies. Well, we really had the exciting opportunity to collaborate with Alejandro Rodriguez's group at Princeton, where his group is very bold. They're willing to take on, they're like, that sounds interesting, we'll see what we can do. They're an expert at inverse design photonics. I'm not gonna talk about inverse design photonics, but this is a revolution that's been happening on the photonic side, which instead of using forward design, like a fabric pro that space this much apart is going to have uh, you know, certain characteristics of the photonic field inside, we say, all right, we're gonna let every single pixel be able to vary and we're going to optimize the device structure within particular constraints for an objective function. And the objective function is get light into this lens. All right. So they, they came back with this thing and it was something that uh, due to Sri's massively amazing fabrication skills, he was actually able to fabricate. So this is actually the gallium phosphide. This is the diamond. Uh, this is the photoresist, uh, e-beam resist mask that you see on top. And you can see that they're, they're pretty impressive. The smallest feature size is around 40 nanometers with a pretty high aspect ratio. The etching down here is, is hundreds of nanometers in this case. And remarkably, um, you, you expect a 15-fold enhancement, theoretically, of what you would observe for collection efficiency. And we were able to see a 14-fold experimental enhancement in one of these devices. So that was amazing. Again, anyone who was like into the weeds of this field would be like, well, what's up with this plot up here? This you said you want to have, you know, no counts at zero time delay. So I know I'm looking at a single photon emitter, but this there's all sorts of weird stuff. Like what are these kind of wings coming up, right? People that do these studies would note that these wings are a sign that bunching is happening at longer time delays. And that's an indication of blinking or something else going out. What happened in this case is when we looked at these devices, you know, this is a native NV, this is an implanted NV, right? This NV is not as good as the other ones that I was showing to you because the ones I just showed you came out of a paper from last year. These NVs came out from a paper from four years ago, but it's still quite good. After we fabricated the devices, there's no signal. You know, you can see this, when you excite for green laser, when you try to tune over it, it's just not there. And it's not there because just the exposure to the diamond, to the plasma that etched the gallium phosphide caused the charge state of the NV center to no longer be negative. It turned into a neutral center. It gave up its charge <laughs> to something nearby at the surface. We were able to do a low temperature oxygen anneal and recover some signal, but it is not, and also, you know, I'm being devious here. Note this is a four and this is a 12. Um, it's not, this is not the same NV center that it once, once was, right? So we can look at this and say, wow, you know, this is what I mean by whack-a-mole. We, we tried some really clever things that are happening in the field to say, all right, we're gonna let the NV center be, try to minimize you know, what we do to it so it can behave so we can do this device integration to en enable scalability. All right, so what now? We kind of have two routes with the nitrogen vacancy center um, and silicon vacancy center. So we're actually focusing on a different center. I'm not gonna talk about it now, um, I, but our route now is no diamond fabrication. Don't even expose it to a plasma. And Natalie de Leon's group at Princeton came up with nice devices, designs with um, gallium phosphide or gallium arsenide that show that you can um, actually, you don't have to etch into the diamond at all and still get very small mode volumes. And these are devices that have been fabricated in my own group uh, because we have that gallium phosphide uh, processing capabilities to make really, really nice features. And so that's one route. The other route is understand and control the surface. That's like kind of glib, right? Just understand and control the surface. Just do that, right? Then you'll be fine. Um, this is something that has become a seriously active area of research. Uh, 
you know, these are just examples from, you know, UW, MIT and Delft and Harvard Princeton collaboration of, of actually doing, using the defect as a sensor to try to inform yourself, inform you what's happening at the surface so you can then control the surface. There's longer term prospects to correlate. These, these experiments take a really long time. I don't think we're going to be able to make the type of progress that we need until we can correlate optical and spin properties in these materials with some type of easier measurements. So there's an effort by the community that says, what can we do that's like surface spectroscopy that's not measuring a single qubit that can tell us what we need to do to the surface in order to have the qubit behave well? And then um, another is just finding qubits that are more resilient to noise. And so that's another avenue that the community is going in um, right now. Okay, so on the issue, so that, this was just talking about stability of one defect. So that was a temporal stability. I also mentioned we want all the defects to be the same, have the same environment spatially. So they emit identical photons and I'm, I'm calling this homogeneity, but I should say spatial homogeneity in this case. Um, I'm not going to, in many ways, the, the same techniques that you would try to make something spatially homogeneous identical are, are, are the same as what you would try to do temporally. Like make the environment as identical as possible would be what you would think. I want to just um, have kind of, I'm not doing this light in full, but I want to, to talk to you about kind of in my head, three ways you accomplish this. All right, and, and really recognize that we have these three different types of tools. I mean, the first tool is just make them all identical. So there's people doing that, like they're trying to just anneal diamond hotter, like do things to make, like start with pure processes, change your growth technique. So that I'm not gonna talk about, all right? I'm gonna say, let, let's just say the defects, we, we get what we get. There's one which is develop protocols less sensitive to inhomogeneity, all right? And this seems like just punting, but we keep getting more and more protocols, especially in sensing, that do this, right? And why can't we have this in quantum information as well? They're kind of the same thing in, in a sense. This is just an example of a magnetic sensing experiment where we can get the same sense, same sensitivity using just pulses. If you use four pulses, as you would doing like a, a full scan of finding every frequency, but if you just use two pulses, you can't because you have issues of inhomogeneity. But if you know where the inhomogeneity is coming, you can sometimes be clever to get rid of it just in the protocol technique itself. So there's protocols. Use what you have, just be smarter about your algorithm. The next one is every time you have an inhomogeneity, it's because your environment is different. If your environment is different, it means your defect has a response to that environment. If your defect has a response to that environment, it means you could do feedback. You can figure out what it's responding to and cancel that, all right? And so this is an example of using external electric fields to offset the internal electric fields that are changing. Here's a defect that is wandering around. And then by applying electrodes to the sample and doing a feedback, you can make it stay in place. It's a proof of principle concept, but one that if it's pushed to its limit, may be needed, right, to keep things to behave, all right? And then the third one, which is really intriguing to me, is, you know what, let the defect do what it wants to do and erase the information about where that photon came from after the defect has admitted it, admitted it. And we talked about doing this in lossy ways because there's a question from the audience. The lossy way was filter, time filter, or spectrally filter. The non-lossy way is to do frequency conversion of some sort. And you can do frequency conversion losing no information essentially to the environment. And so this is just a, a, a non-linear frequency device that's designed here to be triply resonant to convert 637 to 1550 nanometers. I'm not gonna talk about this device today, uh, devices we have right now actually convert 642 to 1556, um, but that would be a, a very electrical engineering talk. But that's a really promising route towards erasing the switch path information that allows the defects to be however they want to be. You know, it's we're an, we're an open society, let them be, and we'll bring everyone together in another way. Okay. 
So with that, um, I will leave that for the whack-a-mole section, which was creation and integration of diamond-based defects in devices. Okay, um, we have a, a couple maybe quick questions. So I think when you were talking about the hybrid devices, you, you mentioned that you can tune um, the resonator. Uh, how do you actually, how do you tune the resonator? Um, in the hybrid devices, all the tuning that I've shown is gas tuning. In this case, we just deposit gas onto it. We actually had a paper come out with second harmonic generation on tuning uh, that came out this past year. This was a really cool technique where it's tuned via exposing the HSQ on the device, your e-beam lithography, and we got a bunch of resonators to be right on top of each other. So there's many ways to tune. We tune of gas because it's super easy and we're just trying for one. That's not gonna work for many, but people are thinking about other ways to tune. Um, and then for the um, sort of NVs outcoupled with the inverse design uh, devices, you sort of mentioned that you got 14X enhancement for one NV. Um, were you- that was, our, that was our best one. Yeah, right. So I guess one question is sort of, were you, did you had you identified nice NVs beforehand and then targeted them with the uh, outcouplers, or you just constructed outcouplers and looked for ones that happened to be above NVs? Yes. Okay. And then what, what what was the yield? I mean, how many devices did you have to fabricate to get one with this nice enhancement? I mean, we always fabricate more devices than we even inspect. That's the beauty. That's the scalable side. We can't measure them. <laughs> we can make them. Um, the paper has the details. It has the, the statistics in it. Um, we only had one that got the 14X. In the end, it has to be perf not perfect. There's like a, a 50 by 50 by 50 nanometer spot placement. Um, and I think maybe we have about 10 devices that, that we showed. Um, we also show the enhancement over an ensemble because that kind of gives you the regular device performance is not as as cool as having the singles, um, but that kind of tells you how they perform. And in many of these cases, you're like, all right, can we get a defect 50 by 50 by 50? Can we then align exactly to those defects that we created by implantation and annealing? And the answer is absolutely yes, you can do that. That will be one student's entire PhD project will be just to get that process to work. And so when we're doing things, we kind of make trade-offs, right? Is that going to be that PhD project or are we just gonna go to show that the device itself works? Yeah. Great, thanks. I think we can, we can uh, move on to the last part of the talk. Okay, so I had the wonderful opportunity to work with Lee Bassett, who is a professor at UPenn on a review article on defects, um, quantum defects by design. And he created this image. <laughs> A bunch of us had ideas. We're like, we need another thing here. We need more lines connecting those. But he created this image. And I really like this image because it really gives you an idea of the parameter space that we're faced with. And it's daunting. It's daunting, right? We have all the materials properties. We have the defect properties. And we have the functionalities that we want for a particular application, right? And it's daunting, but it also gives a lot of hope. The space is so large that if we can find a way to navigate the space, um, it's going to yield great rewards to the community. All right. That said, it was so large, and I felt very overwhelmed for a long time about the space, that I really sought for defects that I could understand without significant computational help, All right? And, there's two kinds of quantum point defects. One is like the nitrogen vacancy center that I talked about. It is like literally a molecule stuck inside of a crystal, right? There's another kind which has very extended wave functions. And this is the phosphorus donor in silicon. This is an STM reconstruction of the electron density in silicon. And you can see it extends really, really far. And this type of defect now takes on properties that are given by the band structure of the material. You don't have to do density functional theory to understand it at a basic level. You now can start to understand how it's going to behave from an easier physics because we had great minds coming up with this physics 50 years ago. Okay. We are looking at donors in a direct band gap material, zinc oxide. I'm being cognizant of time. I have about five minutes left, um, five or six minutes. So I may be skipping a few things as I go along. When you look at a donor in zinc oxide, we're looking at uh, replacing the zinc with one atom right to the right 
of it on the periodic table is either aluminum or gallium or indium in all the studies that we have done so far. Okay. Why? Why use these effective mass defects? Like I said before, the properties are derived from effective mass theory. They can be calculated and from band structure. So these defects have a radiative lifetime of a nanosecond, about a nanosecond, and 90% are into the zero phonon line. And they, they really like need to be measured and quantified like other defects have been. But right now, it will be a surprise if there's some big non-radiated recombination channel versus is we don't know until we calculate like pretty extensive uh, calculations. Um, single substitutional defects. We talked about is there any possibility of creating like quantum registers where they want? Now we don't have to have a nitrogen of vacancy nearby. All we need is one donor, right? Um, so there's, there's a higher potential for deterministic fabrication. And the extended wave function very long term has a potential for combined electronic optical function. Right, because you can actually use electric fields, laboratory scale electric fields, and change what this wave function looks like. Right. For people not so in, familiar with these types of systems, they're a bit different. Um, we create an exciton, meaning we create an electron hole pair, a conduction band electron of a hole in, in the valence band that are then bound coulombically and can like roam around the crystal. Alternatively, you can spontaneously or, or um, you can resonantly create it on a donor. So now we actually have a four particle complex. It's really like a four particle little solar system complex, not like an atom that's been excited. And you can also have it on acceptors. I'm gonna skip this talk about acceptors and say that we've done this work um, in gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, cadmium telluride, and zinc oxide. These are magnetophotoluminescent spectra. They're very rich. There's a lot of physics that are going on into each of these spectra. But I want to take away you to take away a couple of things. These are very well defined Zeeman transitions that we can then focus on with our laser and do resonant excitation. Okay, so we have access to the spins. Um, how they're behaving is almost entirely determined by these four parameters that I have listed right here. And Finally, just because my student, I have a fantastic undergrad who finally enlightened us yesterday. You know, I've been drawing these diagrams for ages. This is what it actually looks like. This is the spatial extent of the donor. The donor bound exciton is actually huge. It's like six nanometers. So that these are the two complexes that we're going between in this case. And we can do spin initialization in all these systems. Uh, you can apply a resonant transition to one of these, and you can collect population or initialize population in the other spin state. And the signature of this is you see a signal, but the longer you keep your pump on, it goes down. All right. And so this is an optical pumping curve of zinc oxide donors, for example. All right, so we can initialize not 100%, but we can initialize fairly well into a single spin state. And then we can also watch the relaxation of the population after we've initialized. This is a T1 measurement, and this is measuring the relaxation time, the classical relaxation time of these spins. So this is the T1 time, and it's going up to about 100, 100 microseconds, 100 milliseconds, sorry, in this case. And you can kind of see why we moved to zinc oxide, right, from the other three materials. And someone can talk to me later about, well, why is it three orders of magnitude better? And I can explain to you about the spin orbit coupling in, in the materials. All right, so we did this experiment, um, and this is to highlight, you know, kind of the, the theoretical footing that these types of experiments are on, and also highlight our theoretical collaborator, Misha Derno. Um, so these two dashed colored lines have no fitting parameters. That's like what you expect. There's no like magnitude, amplitude, anything. Um, and so the theoretical framework for understanding this is really, really robust. We have some deviations, something complicated that's deviating beyond single particle picture, but to get an idea of what you care about, it's things like the density of the material, the effective mass. Uh, and then uh, piezoelectric constants in the material. So those are the types of things that go into this theory, and now we understand it. And you can see at this point now, we're talking about spin relaxation times of 500 milliseconds. 
for these donors in zinc oxide. So quite, quite long approaching seconds um, in this case. We have also uh, a few years ago showed that using all optical techniques, we can probe the spin precession. This is Larmor precession of an ensemble of donors. That's why we see the oscillations. We can watch the spin precession decay in an optical spin echo type sequence. We can measure the ensemble coherence time of 17 nanoseconds, which is limited by the nuclear spins uh, in the material that has not been isotope purified. And we can also do a spin echo where we see about 50 microseconds, which again, we believe is materials limited in this case, not fundamental to the defect itself. So it's it's 50 microseconds, it's not amazing, but it is pretty dirty material that we're working in, okay? And so the next steps is can high quality donors be created via implantation? Can singles be isolated? So this is an example where we don't have singles. We just have these, these look, looking and seeing that we can see reasonable properties. And you know, this is me saying we do need to continue working in diamond, but we also need to look away from diamond. So we did implantation at Sandia of, of, with, with Michael Titze at Sandia's ion beam lab of implanting indium. And here is before implantation. And here's for 10 to the 9, 10 to the 11, 10 to 13. And you get you know, spectrometer limited lines already just for implanting with indium, right? In this particular case, anyone working in diamond would be like, what? You just annealed for an hour at 700 degrees Celsius? How is that possible? That is a short time at a very low temperature. And the inhomogeneous broadening of the indium line right now is smaller than what you see with nitrogen vacancy centers, right, in diamond. Even It even is what nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond are like just grown in, right, in this case. And this is a pretty dirty, dirty material that we just bombarded with a heavy atom with. It's just that it recovers more easily because it's not, it's not diamond, right, it's, in this case. It's an oxide. All right, then the next one is, can single indium donors be isolated? I have a wonderful postdoc, Chris Zimmerman, who's been working with oxides before he came to my group. And he's like, we, we can do focus ion beam milling and we can try to isolate it that way. We come from diamond, people would say, don't do it. That's the worst thing you could do. Putting a bunch of ions in your material is just gonna be a disaster. Um, and he really spearheaded this effort of actually slicing out, this, the, this was done in collaboration with Pacific National, Northwest National Labs, of slicing out this, a little thin slither of this zinc oxide, putting it on its side and looking at what the photoluminescence looked like. After annealing, we can see what looks like to be single indiums in the material. These material, like we have to do G2 still, but they're very well isolated spots that correspond to very sharp lines that are at the indium donor bound exciton line. This is excitation with non-resonant light on a grading spectrometer, which just shows that there's no blinking or bleaching, at least with this type of, of um, system. And what we can then do is we can do PLE. And unlike the surprise with the nitrogen vacancy center after we did the fabrication where it's like, it's just not there. Right? It was in the wrong charge state. In this case, you don't have to repump. You don't have to do anything at all. You just get the PLE curves. I mean, he would say, you don't just get the PLE curves. You just get stable resonant emission um, res of these curves. And now we're talking about line widths of around a few gigahertz, which are the narrowest that we've observed. And these are on these single centers collecting about 7% of the emission because there's almost no uh, phone on or phone on assisted emission in these samples. Okay, so that was just a taste of zinc oxide. I am at time um, right now. So I want to leave you with acknowledgements of all the people that did this work, um, as well as funding acknowledgements at the bottom. And then our most important slide, of course, is this one. Shimon asked, you know, how is it in Seattle? Um, this is our beautiful University of Washington campus. The experiments that you're looking at were done in this building over here. The fabrication was done kind of off this map right here. And of course, this is, this is Mount, Mount Rainier and this is downtown Seattle that you see. And so really this is telling you, come visit us 
and of course, ask me more questions. Um, great. So um, let's see. Uh, so I, I actually have a question. So for the zinc oxide, um, what I don't really know what the isotopes of, of zinc and oxide are like. What's the nuclear spin environment look like? Yeah. So, I mean, oxygen has almost no nuclear spin, but the zinc has uh, like zinc 67 is like 4%. Yeah. And, and so then if you wanted to do some kind of local register of nuclear spins, is that, will that be possible or you don't with know? 4%, so this is, a, this is an interesting question. So an issue with zinc oxide right now is likely, yes, you will not be able to access those nuclear spins optically because the hyperfine coupling is gonna be quite small. Uh, the indium itself is spin nine halves. We also have another defect that's spin one half that I'm not talking about yet, but we'll be talking about shortly. Um, the nine half spin is kind of an interesting <laughs> situation to already have. Uh, we have not optically accessed the indium. The indium hyperfine interaction though is 100 megahertz. So it's huge. Uh, the, it, it's a very, very large hyperfine interaction. The zincs nearby will be significantly smaller than that. Um, okay, another question is, um, and maybe we'll, we'll stop after this one. So for the effective mass defects, um, how broad of a sort of periodic table of hosts and donors is there to explore? Um, it's, it's a lot less broad um, in that it's, you want to look at a semiconductor, you're usually limited to uh, two, six and three, five in this case, and you want to be in a direct band gap material so that it's it's much, much smaller. That said, you could talk about ternary and quadrary semiconductors that will expand the space, but it will also expand this order. So I'm not so sure you'd want to go down, down that route at this point. All right, and I'll say there are some interesting oxides though that are quite complicated that show very bright, stable, sharp emission. So you might also want to go down, go down that route as well. Um, okay, so uh, with that, maybe we can uh, just uh, all thank on behalf of the whole audience, uh, Kaime, for a really excellent and interesting talk. Um, and I want to um, advertise our talk in two weeks by Mark Sapman of University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, just down the hall from me. Um, I don't have his talk title with me right now, but it'll be about um, quantum computing with, with neutral atoms um, using Rydberg interactions. Um, and then I'll just say I'm going to put in both the... Um, YouTube and um, Zoom chats now, the link to talk with Kaime one-on-one um, -on -one or in a, in a more um, you know, direct fashion uh, in a separate uh, Zoom meeting. So you can click on that link and join Kaime there for a post-seminar discussion. Um, and thanks once again, Kaime, for a really excellent talk. Thank you for the invitation. It was my pleasure.